is each speaker will get a 20 minute opening statement when both statements are complete each speaker will get a 10 minute rebuttal following those rebuttals each will get 10 minutes to cross-examine the other at the conclusion of the cross-examinations there will be a 10 minute break and this break is primarily for the participants up here the audience will be asked to stay near your seats or not to wander too far uh, because we'll, we're really going to stick to that 10 minutes and the lights will flash two minutes uh, before we start again. Following the break, there'll be 30 minutes for audience questions. We really do invite you to participate in that. And then we'll conclude with five minutes, a uh, closing statement for each participant. Let me introduce them to you and then we'll get started. Uh, first, in the white, Jimmy Aiken. Jimmy. Uh, Jimmy Aiken is an internationally known author and speaker. He's the senior apologist at Catholic Answers, and he has more than 25 years experience defending and explaining the Christian faith. Jimmy's a convert and has an extensive background in the Bible, theology, the church fathers, philosophy, canon law, and liturgy. Facing him this evening will be Dr. Bart Ehrman. <laughs> Dr. Ehrman is the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He began his teaching career at Rutgers University and joined the faculty in the Department of Religious Studies at UNC in 1988, where he has served as the chair of the department and director of graduate studies. He's the author of many books, six of which have been New York Times bestsellers, and you can follow him, and all proceeds from this go to charity, at the Bart Ehrman blog. Is that correct? Bart, at the Bart Ehrman blog. Ladies and gentlemen, Jimmy Aiken and Dr. Bart Ehrman. <laughs> the resolution for tonight's debate is the canonical gospels are historically unreliable. Dr. Bart Ehrman will be defending the revolution, excuse me, the resolution. Jimmy Aiken will oppose it. At each stage of the debate, Dr. Ehrman will go first. Gentlemen, if you're ready, um, I'll uh, get started. We all set? All right. Dr. Bart Ehrman, the resolution for this evening's debate is the canonical <laughs> gospels are unreliable. You have 20 minutes for your opening statement. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you all for having me. Thank you, Jimmy, for doing this. I appreciate it. Um, how many of you are Catholic? <laughs> how many of you think the gospels are reliable? <laughs> How many of you want to see me get creamed? <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay, I know what I'm up against. <laughs> well, it's a it is a real uh, it is a real pleasure to to be with you. And I uh, uh, I uh, I'm I am not here to um, disabuse anybody of their faith or uh, to try and uh, deconvert anybody. Uh, I'm, I'm here as a historian who's been very interested in this subject for a very, very long time, for my entire adult life. So uh, this is the topic, are the Gospels, uh, his, it's a little bit confusing because we're asking about the reliable, but the resolution is, are they unreliable? So I'm debating that they are unreliable. <laughs> okay, so the, anyway, uh, I want to talk about my key terms. The key terms in this resolution, as far as I'm concerned, are uh, first, uh, historically reliable. In this debate, I will not be talking about whether they are religiously, theologically reliable. They're not, I'm not talking about whether they're reliable about what you, you ought to believe about God or Christ or anything else. I'm interested in the historical question. Do they describe what actually happened? Uh, are they reliable? And when I say reliable, uh, do I mean are they entirely reliable, mainly reliable? Partially reliable, not at all reliable. I think these are, you know, they're, they're different ways to approach this. My questions are actually fairly simple. 
they are. <clears throat> if the Gospels say something happened, did it happen? If they, they say that Jesus said something, did he say it? If they say that Jesus did something, did he do it? And so those are the questions I want to pursue uh, with you. And I'll, I'll start by telling you my basic, my basic view of the matter. Uh, my basic view is that the Gospels do contain significant historical information. Uh, I, I'm not a complete skeptic. I, I think that the Gospels describe the man Jesus as a Jewish uh, preacher in Galilee who talked about the coming kingdom of God and that he gathered disciples, and, uh, and uh, he went to Jerusalem the last week of his life during a Passover feast and uh, was turned over to the authorities and was crucified. Uh, was crucified. I, so, I mean, the basic story, I think, is, is absolutely uh, reliable in the Gospels. But I think, um, in addition to the broad outlines of the things that Jesus did, said, and experienced, there are large numbers of inconsistencies, contradictions, non-historical accounts that make these Gospels unreliable in many, many ways. There are lots of details that are unreliable, I think, in the Gospels, but I'm not going to focus on the details because they're, they're, they might be interesting if you really want every single word to be right. I'm interested in the major ways for this debate that the Gospels uh, seem to me to be unreliable, involving three big issues that I'll try to address in my time. Issues connected with Jesus' birth, Jesus' resurrection, and Jesus' teaching or preaching. Okay, so that's what I'll be talking about, those, those three areas. And I'm going to start with uh, the birth. Jesus was born to uh, the Virgin in uh, Bethlehem. What are our sources of information for the birth of Jesus? just in, in the New Testament. We, do, we don't have sources from outside the New Testament that are going to help us much for any of this material. We, we're restricted to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And what are our sources of information about Jesus' birth in, in, just in the New Testament? Well, we have an account of Jesus' birth in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 1 and 2. We have an account in Luke, chapter 1 and 2. Those are the only passages in the entire New Testament that talk about Jesus' birth in Bethlehem to a virgin. That's interesting. Matthew and Luke don't talk about the birth outside of those first two chapters. They don't refer back to it. And what about other sources in the New Testament? They don't mention it. The virgin birth, of course, is a huge, huge doctrine in the history of Christianity. Um, in, in my part of the world, in the American South, uh, evangelical Protestant evangelicals often say that if you don't believe in the virgin birth, you can't be a Christian. Why aren't there other parts of the New Testament that even talk about it? It's an interesting question that I think a lot of people haven't thought about. Why, why isn't there any account of Jesus' birth in our first gospel, the gospel of Mark? Why isn't there one in the gospel of John? Why doesn't he say anything about Jesus being born of a virgin? What about the Apostle Paul? Why doesn't he talk about the virgin birth? There are 13 letters that claim to be written by Paul. There's not a word about the virgin birth. There are 25, 27 books in the New Testament. 25 of them don't say anything about it. That's interesting. Well, why? The bigger question I'm going to address, though, is how do we explain the differences between the two accounts that we do have? There are lots of differences between these two accounts. People don't realize this because, you know, we, we hear the Christmas story every year and we, we sort of smash it all together in our heads. But when you actually read the accounts, it's pretty interesting. Read Matthew's account and just make a list of what happens. Then read Luke's account, make a list of what happens, and then, read, then compare your two lists. It's very, there are lots of differences. Many of them may not matter to you. Um, Matthew has the wise men coming visit Jesus. Luke has the shepherds. Uh, Matthew has Jesus' family escaping to Egypt. Uh, Luke has them the presentation at the temple and the circumcision. They, these are differences, but you know, well, they're just different. That doesn't mean they're contradictory. There are some potential problems, though, some potential contradictions that I think actually are real uh, contradictions. They involve Bethlehem and Nazareth. Similarity, Matthew and Luke both agree that Jesus was born in Bethlehem but that he was raised in Nazareth. Nazareth is about 100 miles, 80 miles, 100 miles north of, uh, of uh, Bethlehem. 
discrepancies in these two accounts. This one I'm not going to go into, but if you want to look for yourself, just look at the two genealogies, one in Matthew chapter 1 and the other in Luke chapter 3, and ask yourself, who actually was Jesus' grandfather? Was it Jacob or Heli? And who was his great-grandfather and his great-great-grandfather? The different genealogies all the way back to David. Is Jesus descended from David's son Solomon or David's son Nathan? Depends which one you read. Well, that, that's interesting. Just look for yourself and you'll see. I'm more interested in the question of why Bethlehem and why Nazareth, according to these two accounts. So here's how it works. Matthew chapters 1 and 2. In the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph and Mary start out in Bethlehem. Mary gives birth in Bethlehem, and there's a star that is leading the wise men to, uh, to Jesus. The wise men are coming from the east, and they follow the star, and the star apparently stops over Jerusalem. They go into Jerusalem and ask, where is the king of the Jews to be born? And the inquiries get to the king, King Herod. Herod asks his wise men, and not his, his, uh, his scripture scholars, to tell the wise men, and it turns out that the scriptures say that the, uh, the king of the Jews is to be born in Bethlehem. And so the wise men then follow, the star reappears somehow, and it stops over the house. That's interesting. It stops over the house that Jesus is being born in. How does the star stop over a house exactly? Go out tonight and look up at the stars and tell me, which house is that star over? Huh. And it doesn't do much good if it's a comet or a supernova or anything else. I mean, you know, so it can't be really a star. It must be something else. Oh, but that's fine. Uh, what happens, though, is they come in and worship Jesus, and they offer their three gifts. They go back to, they're going to go home then, and they learn by an angel that they can't go back to Jerusalem to tell, uh, to tell Herod because he's out to kill the child. And so they go some other way, and Herod sends out the troops to kill the child. They, they kill all the children. The troops kill all the male children in Bethlehem, the slaughter of the innocents. That, by the way, is a very interesting story. There's no record of that, there's no record of that happening in any ancient document other than this. You would think that would, would be in the newspaper. Uh, Joseph and Mary learn that the Herod's after the child, and so they escape to Egypt. They, they get out of there to escape Herod, and uh, they, they go to Egypt. And of course, you know, if you're, if you're going to Egypt from Bethlehem, you gotta walk. I mean, you can't, you, you can't take a train. <laughs> and so, uh, so it takes a while to get there. And they're, they're in Egypt until Herod dies. When Herod dies, they, they start to return. But they realize they can't go back to Judea, where Bethlehem is in the south, of what we think of as Israel. And so they relocate to Nazareth. And that's why Jesus is born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth, in Matthew. Luke has a very different account. In Luke, Jesus and, uh, Joseph and Mary start in Nazareth. That's where they're from. And it turns out there's a worldwide census. The Roman emperor Caesar Augustus has decided that the entire world has to register for a census. And so everybody has to go to their ancestral home. David goes, uh, I'm sorry, Joseph has to go to Bethlehem to register for the census because he's from the lineage of King David. And King David came from Bethlehem. Now, this is a very weird phenomenon just on the surface of it. Uh, how is it that everybody, what? I mean, Joseph was a thousand years after David. Everybody's going to where their ancestors were a thousand years earlier to register for a census? According to Luke, it's the census of the entire world. Well, that can't be right. It must be the Roman Empire. Okay, the entire Roman Empire. Everybody's going to their ancestral home from a thousand years earlier? How does that work? I mean, suppose, suppose, suppose the Democrats just really take over everything next time, and they decide, you know, we all need to register for a tax, because you know how much they like to tax people, and so, you know, they got to go register, for, and you've got to go to register for this tax. You've got to go to where your ancestors came from a thousand years ago. Where are you going to go? Really? And the entire population's doing this, and it doesn't get reported in the newspaper? There is no record of this. Anywhere, except for Luke. Well, Mary gives birth in Bethlehem, and uh, eight days later, Jesus is circumcised, and then, uh, for, then 32 days after that, they go to the temple to present a sacrifice as commanded in the book of Leviticus, chapter 12, 
So it's 40 days later, and then after that, 40 days after birth, Mary gives her offering, and then they return home to Nazareth. Wait a second. In Matthew, they flee to Egypt. How do they go home 40 days later in Luke if they're on their way to Egypt? And they stay in Egypt until Herod dies. And then they can't come back to Judea because the next ruler is worse than Herod. And so this is months and months, years, I don't know. But Luke says they went back 40 days later. How can that possibly be right? They can't both be right. The deal is, is that either one of them is right and the other is wrong and therefore unreliable. Or they're both wrong and therefore both unreliable. They both can't be right. They can't be right. Let's talk about the resurrection. We have uh, four accounts of the resurrection, and there are some broad similarities. Jesus dies on the third, he's buried. Third day, women go to the tomb, find it empty, and learn that he's been raised from the dead. Basic, basic similarities, but lots of differences. There are lots of minor discrepancies, and some of them matter. To illustrate, how do the disciples of Jesus learn that he's been raised from the dead in each gospel? Simply read them yourselves. You'll see. In the gospel of Mark, we're explicitly told that the women go to the tomb. They learn that he's been raised from the dead. They are told to go tell his disciples that he's been raised and he will meet them in Galilee. And the women fled from the tomb and they didn't say anything to anyone because they were afraid, period. The gospel stops there. They didn't tell anyone. That's the end of the gospel of Mark. In Matthew, uh, I should put Matthew here, Matthew, Luke, and John, the women go to the tomb, they hear that Jesus has been raised, go, supposed to go tell the disciples, and they go right away and they tell. Well, which is it? Where do the disciples go if they go anywhere? Mark and Matthew, Mark presupposes that they're supposed to go to Galilee. Matthew says they go to Galilee, and that's where they meet Jesus. But in Luke, in Luke, the women hear about Jesus being raised, and then Jesus appears to two followers the same day, we're told. The women go tell the disciples, and while they're talking to the disciples, Jesus shows up on the same day, and then he takes them out, and he tells them, don't leave Jerusalem in, in the south. Don't leave Jerusalem. Stay in Jerusalem until you receive the Spirit. When you get to the next book written by the same author, Acts, they're in Jerusalem 40 days later. And they stay in Jerusalem after that. Jesus appears to them in Jerusalem and tells them not to leave, and they don't leave for months. In Matthew, they go straight to Galilee. How could it be both? It can't be both. Where do they see Jesus? Do they see Jesus anywhere? Not in Mark. In Mark, the women don't even tell anybody. In Matthew, they see Jesus only in Galilee. They make a trip up to Galilee. They go up to Galilee. They're in Galilee. They see Jesus, and then he leaves them. In Luke, however, they see him only in Jerusalem, and tells them, Jesus tells them, don't leave Jerusalem, and they stay in Jerusalem. They see Jesus, and then he ascends to heaven. Well, which, how can they... Just read them yourself. They differ from each other in, way, in a way that can't be reconciled. How can all of these accounts be right? What about Jesus preaching? Uh, there are lots of things we could say about Jesus' message. Uh, and for this, just for this, because of the short amount of time, I just want to talk about what Jesus said about himself. What does Jesus teach about himself in the various Gospels? Well, I'll start with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. As you know, uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, uh, as you may know, they're, they're, they're very common. They're very, they're, they have a lot in common, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So much in common that they're usually called the synoptic gospels. And synoptic means you can see them together. 
So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are so similar. They tell so many of the same stories, usually in the same sequence, first this and this and this and this, and often in the same word, word for word the same, that you can put them in columns next to each other and just kind of read and compare them to each other because they're so similar. And John is very different. But the, the, the difference is really quite striking when it comes to Jesus' message in particular. What does Jesus preach about in the Synoptic Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? Well, the dominant theme by far, you'll see if you just read them, just by far is Jesus preaches about God and his kingdom. God's kingdom is soon to arrive on earth. You need to repent and prepare for it. The very first recorded words of Jesus are in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. The time has been fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. God's kingdom is almost here. Get ready for it. And throughout his, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he's telling people how to get ready for it. Turn back to God. Obey God. Love one another. Love God. Because the kingdom is coming. What does Jesus say about himself in these Gospels? He does say that he has to go to Jerusalem and be rejected and executed and that he will rise from the dead. What does he say about his personal identity in Matthew, Mark, and Luke? About coming down from heaven or being a divine being or being, what does he say about it? Nothing. He will, if somebody calls him the Messiah, he'll tacitly agree to it or at the end uh, actually agree to it. Uh, he'll agree he's the Messiah. He will, uh, and so there are things, but in terms of what does he say about himself? So people can say, well, who are you? Uh, well, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's not something he talks about. What about the Gospel of John? In the Gospel of John, that's all he talks about. He doesn't talk about God and his coming kingdom in the Gospel of John. Jesus talks about who he is, his identity. For example, the I am sayings in the Gospel of John. These are the most distinctive sayings of the Gospel of John where Jesus identifies himself. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus talks about himself as the one who has come from the Father to earth to reveal the truth so people can know the truth about him so that they, they, can, they can have eternal life. That's the entire thing in the Gospel of John. And sometimes these I am sayings are really quite striking because sometimes he simply says, I am. In the Old Testament, in the Exodus, book of Exodus, chapter 3, when Moses asks God, what is your name? God says, I am. Tell them that I am has sent you. That's the name of God. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says, before Abraham was, I am. Whoa. Whoa. He's claiming to be God. And the Jewish opponents know that. They take up stones to stone him to death. Uh, these are pretty, pretty uh, interesting claims. Uh, one, pla one place Jesus says, the John 10, 30, the Father and I are one. They pick up stones again. Chapter 14, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus is claiming to be God in John. And he never claims that in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That is interesting. Is this a contradiction? No, this is not a contradiction. Uh, he might have said something, you know, said different things at different times. But it doesn't seem to me to make any sense. Scholars for a long time have recognized that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are based on earlier sources. Sources that provide these Gospels with their material. Mark itself was probably copied by Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke had some other source. You might have heard of a source called Q. It's a, it's a hypothetical source, but it appears to be a source used by Matthew and Luke for their, many of their sayings of Jesus, like the Lord's Prayer, for example, or the Beatitudes. That They're not in Mark, but they're in Matthew and Luke. They had a source, Q. Matthew has some of his own stories, the wise men. And so that's a separate source. They call it M for Matthew's source. Luke had a separate source for his stories, like the Good Samaritan, call it L. None of these sources has Jesus talk about himself or call himself God. Mark, Q, M, L, Matthew, Luke. These are earlier than John. If Jesus spent his ministry 
talking about himself as a divine being, calling himself God. If you knew that, wouldn't you want to mention that part? These six sources don't even mention it? That seems to me odd. I think John is not reporting what Jesus really said. In short, are the Gospels historically reliable? I don't think so. Thank you. <clears throat> Jimmy Aiken, you have 20 minutes for your opening statement. Wait for the uh, PowerPoint to switch over. There we go. Okay. I feel bad for Bart because I didn't realize we were going to have the screen way over there. So I'm going to angle my laptop so you can That's follow great. along. That's great. Thank you. Okay. So first of all, thank you everybody uh, for coming. Hope you're having a great evening and I hope to make it greater if possible. I, uh, I want to apologize for that because that's kind of a spoiler. I probably should have given you a spoiler warning first, but uh, it is uh, what we're uh, debating tonight. And uh, Bart has made a few specific challenges to places in the Gospels where he thinks they contain errors or at least things that are odd. And I'll be happy to talk about those later, like in our cross-examination period or in the audience question period. But what I need to do right now is give you a sketch of the big picture. So as Cy mentioned, our debate uh, resolution is that the Gospels are historically unreliable. And you might wonder why put it that way. Well, normally what will happen, at least very frequently, what will happen in my experience is skeptics will come to believers and demand that they prove the Gospels are reliable. Why should I believe those Gospels are reliable? But I think it's healthy to look at questions from both perspectives. And so I think it's healthy, once in a while at least, to have skeptics bear the burden of proof and show why a believer should say that the Gospels are unreliable. So that's what we're doing tonight. Now, in a debate, at least a formal one like this, the person who agrees with the resolution has the burden of proof. So Bart agrees that the Gospels are unreliable, so Bart must show tonight that the Gospels are unreliable. I only have to show that Bart hasn't proven his case. We need to talk for a moment about the difference between reliability and inerrancy. Reliability is something we all have a gut sense of. You know, when something is reliable, it means it works, at least most of the time. But what about inerrancy? It's kind of an unfamiliar term to some folks, but it means if a source is inerrant, it means that it contains no errors. It's 100% accurate. In fundamentalist Christianity, they have a particular interpretation of inerrancy that's very common that would say the Gospels are inerrant in such a way that they, for example, have a word-for-word -word transcript of everything that Jesus says is exactly, there's no paraphrasing going on, and not only Jesus, but everyone who talks to Jesus or everyone who says anything at all in the Gospels, we always have a word-for-word -word transcript. And that's how they understand inerrancy. But there are more nuanced interpretations of inerrancy, and the Catholic Church has one. If you uh, want to read about it, at least at a kind of top level, you could go to sections 11 to 13 of the Vatican II document Dei Verbum. But we've got a question. How could we verify if the Gospels were inerrant? I mean, how would you, how would you determine that? Well, for most Christians, it's a matter of faith. You know, we've seen evidence that leads us to believe in the Christian faith, and we're taught as part of the Christian faith that the Gospels are inerrant, and so we accept that. But we're not here to debate faith tonight. As Bart said, we're looking at the Gospels from a historical perspective and what a historian could make of them. Well, from a historical perspective, if you wanted to verify that the Gospels are 100% accurate in everything they say, you'd have to go back in time and check to see if every claim can be verified with your own eyes. But without a time machine, you won't be able to do that. And so we're not debating inerrancy tonight. All we're debating is reliability. And reliability is a spectrum. You can have some sources that are 100% accurate, which would make them inerrant. 
or you could have some sources that are 100% inaccurate. Nothing they say is right. But our question is not a spectrum question. We're asking a yes or no question. Are the Gospels reliable or are they unreliable? So how would we determine that given that reliability is a spectrum? I mean, where would you draw the line on that spectrum and say, okay, if a document gets up to this point or higher, it's reliable, but if it's below this point, we're going to call it unreliable. Well, one place you could draw the line is right at the top, at the 100% level, and say, okay, unless a document is inerrant, unless it's 100% right on everything, we're going to say it's unreliable. But that's not how we use the word reliable in ordinary life. I mean, for example, most people have friends. I know I do. I assume Bart does. And we have friends that we would consider reliable. You know, they, they tell us what they think. They help us when we're in trouble. They show up for appointments. You know, they're reliable friends. But we don't, if a friend makes just one mistake, say, oh, that friend is is fundamentally unreliable. He made one mistake. And so reliability isn't the same thing as inerrancy. So how can we say what it is? Well, if we don't put the line at the top of the spectrum, we might put it somewhere else, like say at the 50% level. You know, at that level, you could say, well, if it's above that, it's right most of the time. And so it's reliable most of the time. If it's below that level, it's fundamentally unreliable. Or you might, uh, you might say, I want it to be higher than that. I mean, I wouldn't consider a friend who's reliable half the time to be a really reliable friend. So you might put it elsewhere. You might say, put it at the 75% level or at some other level. But there's a problem because as we noted, if you want to assign a percentage like 100% to the reliability of a document, from a historical perspective rather than a faith perspective, you're going to need a time machine. No time machine means no way to go back and check out all these claims, and thus there's no way to establish some percentage and say, well, if it meets this, then it's reliable. So we can't use percentages as a way of measuring reliability. We have to do something else. So what can we do? Well, I would note that, got, that documents tend to make different kinds of claims. Some of them are major claims, which deal with the most important facts and themes and events that the document discusses. Some of them are intermediate claims, which are not the most important, but still important facts, themes, and events. And then there are lesser claims, like individual details and minor themes and events. And I would propose, in light of that, that a source may be judged historically reliable if we can verify many of its major claims, many of its intermediate claims, and many of its lesser claims. So if we can check it out and show, wow, a bunch of its major claims and intermediate claims and lesser claims, they're accurate, then we can judge it to be historically reliable until we've seen enough errors to counterbalance this. So if you see a picture like this with lots of verified claims on the major, intermediate, and minor levels, then you can judge that document historically reliable. Now, of course, you need to understand how to read the document. Like if it's an ancient document, you need to know how ancient sources work so you can interpret it correctly. And I'll have more to say about that in my second statement. But for the moment, let's look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see what we can determine about their reliability. Well, here's a list of major claims that the Gospels make. Jesus existed. Jesus was a Jew. He lived in the first century in Roman Palestine. He had a reputation as a teacher on both moral and prophetic subjects. He gathered disciples, including an inner circle of 12 disciples. He was crucified, and the man who put him to death, the man who ordered him crucified, was the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. So how can we evaluate these claims? Well, I'd love to be able to present you with all the evidence I'm aware of, but I've got 11 minutes left in this opening statement. So 
Um, I'm going to have to do something else. And fortunately, we have with us tonight Bart Ehrman. See, he's right up there. <laughs> and he's also right here, incarnate, as it were. So what does Bart Ehrman make of these major gospel claims? Well, one thing, as a historian, he's not going to say that a historical document ever gives you absolute certainty about what happened in the past, but it will give you probabilities. And so even though he wouldn't say that we have ontological certitude that certain things happened about Jesus, he will say the Gospels are probably right about some things. In fact, he already said it in his opening statement. And sometimes he'll say they're very, very probably right. So what about that first major gospel claim that Jesus existed? Well, Bart Ehrman says that's right. In fact, he wrote a book called Did Jesus Exist? Where in which he combats mythicists. Jesus mythicists who say Jesus didn't really exist. He was just a myth. Bart wrote an entire book refuting that point of view. And I think he deserves credit. Well, let's give Bart a big hand of applause. Thank you. And this is something that Bart and I agree about. Jesus really existed. High five. Yeah. So, Bart agrees that Jesus existed. What does he think about these other major claims? Well, uh, without making too long of a point of it, he thinks that the Gospels are right when they say Jesus was a Jew who lived in the first century in Palestine, who was a teacher on moral subjects, on prophetic subjects, who gathered disciples, who had an inner circle of 12 disciples, who was crucified, and who was sent to his crucifixion by Pontius Pilate. So Bart agrees on all these major gospel claims. Well, what about intermediate claims, things of a slightly lesser scale in the gospels? Well, uh, the gospels say that Jesus was lived in the first century, but more specifically, they indicate he was an adult in the AD 20s. Bart Ehrman says that's right. The gospels indicate Jesus lived in Roman Palestine, but more specifically, they say he came from Nazareth. Bart says that's right. The Gospels say Jesus was connected with John the Baptist. Bart agrees. Jesus was baptized at the beginning of his ministry, according to the Gospels. Bart agrees. John the Baptist was one, the one who did the baptism, and Bart agrees. What about John the Baptist himself? Well, uh, the Gospels indicate that John preached a message of coming destruction and salvation. Bart says that's right. The Gospels also indicate that Jesus agreed with John the Baptist's message. Bart says that's right, too. Jesus not only was a teacher, but one of the ways he taught was in parables, according to the Gospels. Bart says that's right. One of Jesus' major themes in his teaching was the kingdom of God. And Bart said that, in fact, in his opening statement. Jesus believed that he was the king of that coming kingdom, or the Messiah. And Bart says Jesus did believe that. Jesus taught that there was a coming reversal of fortunes where the exalted would be humbled and the humble would be exalted, according to the Gospels and according to Bart Ehrman. Jesus didn't think that you needed to scrupulously observe the Mosaic Law in the way that some thought you did. Bart agrees. Also, Jesus believed that the heart of the Mosaic Law was the love of God and the love of neighbor. Bart signs off on that too. And Jesus believed that the way to attain the kingdom was through love of God and neighbor. Once again, the Gospels and Bart agree. Because Jesus' teachings were different than other Jewish teachers, Jesus was in conflict with them. He also spent much of his preaching ministry in Galilee. But at the end of the ministry, he went to Jerusalem for Passover. And he predicted the destruction of the temple. And he was betrayed to the Jewish authorities. He had a follower named Judas. Judas was the man who betrayed him to the Jewish authorities. <clears throat> the Jewish authorities then handed him over to Pilate. And Pilate had him crucified for calling himself the king of the Jews. On all of these points, the Gospels are probably right, according to Bart Ehrman. So Bart not only agrees that the major claims we covered are accurate, but all of these intermediate ones as well. What about lesser matters of detail, you know, smaller stuff, 
Well, Jesus, unlike the Pharisees, did not interpret the Sabbath command as strictly or degrees. Jesus did not, unlike the Sadducees, understand the temple rituals and sacrifices the way the temple cult did. Jesus did not think people, unlike the Essenes, did not think people should isolate themselves in order to maintain ritual purity. Jesus said that the kingdom would be brought about by a cosmic judge called the Son of Man. Jesus said that the kingdom of God had already begun, even though it was still coming. Jesus spoke of leaving one's family for the sake of the kingdom. That's an individual saying of Jesus, so it's definitely on the minor scale of things. Jesus privately taught the twelve that he was the Messiah. He did not, however, publicly proclaim that he was the Messiah to Jews in general, at least not till the end. Jesus, and the reason he didn't do that is presumably because Jesus did not understand his kingship as a worldly political one. Bart agrees with that too. The Gospels also preserve Jesus' sayings in the parable of the sheep and the goats. Jesus himself was the one who, who commissioned the twelve. And another individual saying he told the twelve, this one's only in Luke, he told the twelve that they would sit on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Jesus associated with tax collectors and sinners, and religious leaders mocked him as a result. Jesus had conflict with some members of his own family, and some members of his family didn't believe in him during his public ministry. That trip he made to Jerusalem for Passover at the end, that was around A.D. 30, according to the Gospels and according to Bart Ehrman. He came to Jerusalem, though, not just for Passover, but a week before Passover, according to the Gospels, and Bart says that's probably right. Jesus proclaimed his apocalyptic message at Jerusalem at the end. He objected to the money changing and the selling of animals at the temple, and he, as a result, reacted violently and caused a disturbance in the temple. After the temple incident, Jesus suspected his time was up, but when he was handed over to the Jewish authorities, they didn't try him just according to their own law. They instead handed him over to Pilate, and they didn't have to go far, because the Gospels say, and Bart agrees, that Pontius Pilate was in Jerusalem at the time. As a result, Pilate gave Jesus a brief trial. It did not go on for days or weeks. When asked if he was the king of the Jews, Jesus either answered ambiguously or in the affirmative, according to the Gospels and according to Bart. The man who betrayed Jesus, Judas, died some kind of untimely death, and his death was somehow connected with a field in Jerusalem. And there's more. That's only some of the things that in my reading for the debate, I discovered Bart found, thinks the Gospels are probably right about. So this is what we're looking at. Bart, the skeptic, agrees the Gospels are probably right about all these major claims, all these intermediate claims, and all these lesser claims. And that's quite a lot. I would say that this is enough to judge the Gospels historically reliable until we've seen enough errors to counterbalance this. And so we've got to weigh things. Well, tonight, Bart has proposed a few places in the Gospels where he thinks they contain errors. I don't think they are, and we can talk about that later. But for the sake of argument, let's give him those. I notice that they aren't major claims. He's admitted the major story is right. Instead, they're on some intermediate matters or some lesser matters. But fundamentally, this does not counterbalance this. And so I conclude, yes, the Gospels are historically reliable. Thank you. Uh, each of the participants will now have uh, a 10-minute rebuttal. Dr. Bart Ehrman is first. Well, thank you, Jimmy. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm right about so many things. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to hear. It's been a long time in a debate where I've heard that. <laughs> so, thank, you, thank you very much. Uh, these, 
these rebuttals are the hardest part of doing a debate because you know we had no idea what each other was going to say, and so uh, uh, and so it, they tend to be a little bit complicated. I want to I want to say a, a couple of things. I uh, yes, the things Jimmy said that I said are right. I mean that's right. I mean I, I wrote a, in addition to the book Did Jesus Exist? I wrote a book called Jesus: The Apocalyptic Prophet of the New Millennium. Um, many years ago, and I laid out all of these things, and so that's no mystery. These things that these are so you know I'm obviously not going to disagree with them. Of course, I agree with all of those things, um, and yet I think the gospels are not reliable. So what does it mean exactly? Um, I don't think that it's quite right to say that the issues I pointed out are not major claims. If Matthew and Luke are not they don't agree about the virgin birth. Uh, one of them's making stuff up or getting information from somebody who made stuff up, or they both are. And the resurrection, this is not a minor claim. This is a major claim. Uh, Jesus' teachings about himself. So I'm, I'm, I'm only talking about major matters. If you want to talk about lesser matters, I can assure you I can go all night uh, talking about small details, uh, the really lesser matters. Uh, is the genealogy of Jesus a lesser matter? Um, okay, maybe it's a lesser matter. Why is there a contradiction exactly? Um, so it's an interesting way of kind of sketching it out, that if you get these major things right, then it's reliable. So I was just trying to think, well, Jimmy was doing that because I, I didn't know he was going to be doing it, but it just occurred to me that, you know, suppose I, suppose I tell you that... Um, there's a city, New York City, and it's the biggest city in the United States. It's located in New York State. It has a great theater district. There's a financial district. Uh, it, uh, and so I, I give like big facts about New York City. You say, oh yeah, that's basically reliable. But then I look at my sources, and one of my sources says that Manhattan has six million people in it, and another says it has 20 million people in it. One source says it's on the Hudson River, another says it's on the Mississippi River. One says it's 30% African-American. Another source says it's 80% African-American. One says that the Empire State Building is in Manhattan. Another says it's in Brooklyn. One says the baseball teams are the Mets and the Yankees. And the other said, no, it's the Dodgers and the Angels. Uh, one says that it's the headquarters of the CIA. Uh, one says that there's only one international airport there. And so, I mean, you could just go down the list. And uh, if we had more than... 20 minutes, the, the list for the gospel would be very, very long indeed. Let me explain like how this matters in terms of a big picture. In the gospel of Mark, we have an account of Jesus' death that is one of the most moving stories in the New Testament. I'm talking about Mark's gospel. The thing is to train yourself to read each of these gospels individually because Mark has a message for you. And if you pretend that he's saying what John is saying, then you're ignoring Mark's message to you. John has a message for you, and you can't pretend that John's saying the same thing that Luke is saying. Mark's account of Jesus' death is, is so compelling. Jesus is uh, turned over to the authorities. He goes before Pontius Pilate, and Pontius Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And the only thing Jesus says is, you say so, in Mark. Su legage, you say so. And he doesn't defend himself. And he's condemned. And so he's taken off to be, to, to be executed. And he doesn't say anything the entire way. He's silent. And at, they nail him to the cross, and he's silent in Mark. He's hanging on the cross, and he's silent. Both robbers, uh, both robbers mock him, and he's silent. People passing by mock him. The Roman soldiers mock him. Everybody mocks him. He's hanging on the cross. He hasn't said anything this entire time, as if he's in shock in Mark's gospel. And at the very end, the only thing he says is he cries out. At the very end, he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he dies. Whew. Jesus, at the end, appears to be in shock. He doesn't say anything, and he wonders why God himself has forsaken him. 
This is a powerful presentation. And the thing is that, that the reader knows why this is happening, even if Jesus in the story doesn't. Because right when Jesus dies in Mark's gospel, the second he dies, the curtain in the temple rips in half from top to bottom. And the centurion who's just crucified him says, sees how he's died. He says, truly this man was the son of God. Jesus' death rips the curtain. The curtain is the, the curtain separating uh, the Holy of Holies, where God himself dwelt from everyone else. Nobody could go behind the curtain except the high priest would go once a year for the Day of Atonement and make an atonement for his sins, the atonement for the sins of the people once a year. He's the only one who could go in there, could only go in there once a year. But now Jesus has died, and everybody has access to God because of his death. But he's in doubt at the end. He doesn't know why it's happening, but you know, and God knows that it's bringing salvation, and the centurion recognizes it. The centurion is the only one in this whole gospel who realizes that Jesus has to die even though he's the son of God. In fact, he's the son of God because he had to die. But Jesus at the end is in despair. That's Mark. Contrast that with the gospel of Luke. Luke has a completely different portrayal. In Luke's gospel, Jesus is condemned. He goes out to be crucified, but he's not silent on the way to crucifixion. He sees some women weeping by the side of the road, and he turns to them and he says, Daughters of Jerusalem, don't weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children, for the fate that's to befall you. There's nothing about him being in shock here. He's, he's worried more about these women than he is. He's going off to be crucified. He's worried about these women. He goes to the place of crucifixion, and he's not silent. They nail him to the cross, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And on the cross, he's not silent. He has an intelligent conversation with one of the other people being crucified. One of these criminals starts abusing Jesus, and the other one turns his head to the man and says, to not, don't do this because we deserve what we're get, getting, but he hasn't done anything to deserve this. And he turns his head to Jesus and he says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. In Luke's gospel, Jesus knows exactly what's happening to him. He knows why it's happening to him. And he knows what's going to happen to him after it happens to him. And at the very end, the most telling thing of all, at the end, Jesus does not cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In Luke's gospel, Jesus instead says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Dies. Here, Jesus is calm and in control. He understands. There's no agony, no despair. What happens, though, is that people take Mark's gospel, and they take Luke's gospel, and they smash them together so that Jesus says and does everything that's in Mark and in Luke, and then they throw in Matthew, which is different, and John, which is different, and you end up with a mishmash. You have taken each individual author and you've ignored what he's trying to tell you. You've created your own gospel in your head. You have written the gospel by combining the four. And so you end up with the seven last words of the dying Jesus. He doesn't say those seven things in any of the gospels. He says one here, one here, one here, one here. And each one is having him say these things to make a point and now you've chosen to ignore his point because you're thinking they're all reliable, so it all happened. I don't think that's the way to read the Gospels. I think when you do that, you're depriving each of these authors of what he has to say. They can't be all right, all correct, unless you smash them together and make each of them say something different from what they actually say. You're ignoring what the message is from each of these. That's the problem. This is not a minor matter. This is not a lesser issue. Each gospel has a different presentation, and if you don't have the differences, you don't have these four gospels. 
I see that as a value of these Gospels, not a hindrance. And if you say they're all reliable historically, then you're ignoring the messages that each one wants to give you. That's my opinion. Jimmy Aiken, 10 minutes for rebuttal. We'll let him get the PowerPoint up. There we go. So, oh, actually, that's the wrong file. Here we go. Okay. So, um, Bart has made some challenges to individual passages in the Gospels that he thinks are likely not accurate. Um, and he said that some of these are ones where uh, it's actually something important. He said major. And specifically, I was taking notes, he said Matthew and Luke disagree about the virgin birth and that the Gospels generally disagree about the resurrection. But of course, that's not true. Matthew and Luke agree that Jesus was born of a virgin. The points that Bart thinks are erroneous are indeed lesser matters because they agree, both of them make the point explicitly, Jesus was born of a virgin. Similarly, all four of the Gospels agree Jesus was resurrected. So wherever there may, they may have differences, it has to be on a lesser matter, not one of the top line major claims. But really, because we are so limited tonight in our time, you can't thrash through this subject in just a couple hours. You need to do more work. And I'm sure Bart would agree with me that if you really want to go through this, you need to do further study. And so I want to do two things that will help you with that further study. The first one is I have collected some resources for you on my website. And if you go to jimmyakin.com slash Bart, then you will find this. <laughs> and you'll find a list of, uh, of links to different resources. And I want to call attention to the one right up at the top, because if you click on that link, here's what you find. Where Bart and I agree, because Bart agrees the Gospels are probably right on all those things we covered, and there were a bunch of them. And I agree that they're right on those things, so I like to lead with the positive. And so I wanted to show you up front where Bart and I agree. But of course, I, oh, and in the Where Bart and I Agree file, you'll find the claims as well as quotations from Bart so you can see what he has to say in his own words. So you can see I'm not just making stuff up. But of course, I don't think Bart is right about everything. Uh, and so you'll also find links to things like how ancient authors wrote, uh, what about the enrollment or census at Jesus' birth? That commonly comes up in such discussions. Bart's brought it up before. How the infancy narratives fit together. Also, questions about Jesus' genealogies, like who is his grandfather? Um, also, uh, what about when he was crucified and how do the different crucifixion and resurrection accounts fit together? So you can use those resources. I mean, you can read Bart's books. You can also read these to help you out in your further study. I also want to mention a few writing practices that ancient authors used, because if you want to read an ancient document, you need to know what the rules were, how the author worked. And so I want to mention three different uh, writing practices that you'll find in ancient authors, including the authors of the Gospels. The first one is selection. And select, authors had to be selective because they couldn't mention everything or everyone in their writing. So, for example, Mark mentions a story where Jesus healed a blind man. But if you look at Matthew's account, Matthew mentions that there were two blind men on this occasion. And neither one of those is a mistake. They're not contradicting each other. Mark has simply selected one of the blind men to focus his story on, and Matthew selected both of them. And I've heard Bart before say that, you know, that selection and some authors, including some details that are omitted by others, that's not a contradiction. Am I right, Bart? Yes. Awesome. I like being right about stuff occasionally, too. <laughs> another, uh, another ancient writing practice is paraphrase. 
And uh, paraphrase refers to communicating the same meaning in different words. For example, if you go to a coworker and it's the end of the day and you tell him, the boss said we can go home now. Well, maybe the boss used those exact words, but maybe he said something else. Maybe he said, it's getting late, I'll see y'all tomorrow. Well, in that case, you've accurately reported the meaning of what your boss said, that you can go now, but you've used different words. And that's what a paraphrase is. It's communicating the same thing in different words. Another ancient writing practice we need to be aware of is sequencing, how authors arranged or sequenced their material. And sometimes ancient authors, like modern ones, would list things in chronological order. But sometimes they would list it in some different order, like such as by topic. For example, uh, in his biography of the Roman Emperor Caligula, the Roman historian Suetonius first lists Caligula's princely deeds, and then he turns to look at Caligula's monstrous deeds. So he keeps the two categories of things together. First, the princely things Caligula did, then the monstrous things Caligula did. He's using a topical ordering. We see the same kind of thing in the Gospels. For example, in Mark, Jesus first curses the fig tree, then he goes to the temple and clears it, and then they come back and see that the fig tree is withered. But Matthew, characteristically of Matthew, likes to keep stuff on the same topic together. So he's got these two stories on the topic of the fig tree. It was cursed, and then it was found withered, and so Matthew puts those together because they're on the same topic. When you are aware of these writing practices, it'll take care of the large majority of different passages where people have questioned whether the Gospels are accurate. And there's something else that's important to realize about these, which is they involve approximations. And it's important to recognize when an author is approximating rather than giving you the specific, precise details. Let's look at a common example. It happens every day. Captain Kirk says, when will we arrive at the planet? Mr. Chekhov says, in two hours, Captain. At which point Spock says, correction, Ensign, we will arrive in one hour, 59 minutes, and 47.5 seconds at which point Kirk does this, because Mr. Spock has just made an error in reading Mr. Chekhov. He assumed Chekhov was being precise when really Chekhov was approximating. And notice that neither is wrong. Chekhov is not wrong in saying we're gonna be there in two hours, and Spock is not wrong in saying we're gonna be there a few seconds ahead of two hours. They're both just using different degrees or levels of approximation. Chekhov is giving us the gist, he's rounding off the time, whereas Spock is being precise. And so, here's why this is important to the Gospels. Ancient authors usually had to give the gist. They had no tape or video recorders, they usually had no transcripts, they had no clocks. So they had to give the gist of what happened because they didn't have the small details available to them. And as a result, their audiences typically expected gist accounts, just like Captain Kirk would expect Mr. Chekhov to give an approximation of when we get to the planet. So it's a mistake to do what Mr. Spock did and press the details of a gist account because the details aren't meant to be precise. They're meant to be approximate and to convey the essence of what happened. And we all approximate, we all give the gist. Like when you tell your coworker, the boss said, we can go home now, when really he said, I'll see you later. We must apply the gist principle to ancient authors, including the authors of the Gospels. They are not wrong for giving a gist account with approximate details. They're simply using a different level of approximation that we might like, because we do live in a culture filled with recording devices and word-for-word -word transcripts. So what are our takeaways from this? Well, when reading the Gospels, don't be Mr. Spock. Don't expect more precision than the evangelists are trying to provide. The evangelists are intending to give us gist accounts, and the important thing is that the gist is accurate. Like, we're going to be at the planet in two hours. We've seen 
the Gospels are right on the gist lots. And as long as the gist is accurate, the Gospels are doing what they are intending to do, which is give us a historically reliable account of the gist or essence of Jesus's life and teachings. So judged by their own standards, yes, the Gospels are historically reliable. Thank you. Now each of our participants will have uh, 10 minutes to cross-examine uh, the opponent. I believe this starts with Dr. Ehrman. Yeah, well. right, yeah. Okay, Dr. Ehrman, you have 10 minutes. And well, we won't start while he's drinking the water. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Uh, yeah, uh, again, I agree with most of that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, Jimmy, do you think there are things in the Gospels that the Gospel writers invented rather than recording things that actually happened? I think that there are situations like when a, a, a sick person comes up to Jesus and says, please heal me, that they would uh, reconstruct what such a person would likely have said. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, are there stories that you think were not historical that are in the Gospels? I don't think there are entire stories that are, no. What about like in, in Matthew's gospel where uh, Jesus dies and these uh, people come out of the tombs and they, they wander around? you think that's something that actually happened? Well, the gospels record that Jesus rose from the dead and they record that Lazarus rose from the dead and Jairus' daughter rose from the dead and uh, the widow of Nain's son rose from the dead. So I don't see why other people couldn't have risen yeah. from the dead as well. No, I'm, I'm just wondering, wondering yeah. what you thought. Yeah. So, yeah, good. So um, do you think Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Yes, I do. How do you account for the fact that uh, Matthew and Luke disagree about how it happened? In, uh, I'll answer, but in what respect do you have in mind? In Luke, there's a census. They have, they're from Nazareth. Mm -hmm. uh, and in Luke, they have to go to Bethlehem. And while they're there to register for the census, it happens to be the time when, when Mary goes into labor and mm -hmm. she gives birth. In Matthew... Well, let's stop there. I'll answer that one. Then you hit me with your next one. Well, no, this is the same question. I'm showing the contradiction between the two. No, no, I meant... Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But, okay, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, that's not a contradiction. That's a selection difference. Oh, no, no, no. I'm, I haven't given the contradiction yet. Then you have it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's not... There's no contradiction there. That's just that's just Luke's account, right? Yeah. I mean, he, they, they go for a census and she gives birth there. Whereas in Matthew, they, um, they're, in, they're in Bethlehem. <laughs> And they flee to uh, they flee to Egypt. But when they come back from Egypt, they want they want to go back to Judea, but they can't. That shows that their their home is in Judea, and so they relocated to Nazareth. So in one of them, they're from Nazareth, and in the other, they're from Bethlehem. So how do you? I think that uh, my own view is that they had homes in more than one place, that Joseph was originally from Bethlehem, so he had property there, and he moved to Nazareth for work, and he had property there. Historically, you think that's, that he had two homes? Yeah. Um, At least I think he was part owner of the family estate owner. in Bethlehem. So you think they've got, they've got a sizable income? Well, I think that they were economically deprived enough. He had to leave Bethlehem for work. So I, but he's maintaining a home in both places. That's an interesting idea. I hadn't thought of that. I mean, I, I, it's a little bit, uh, we know a lot about Judaism in the first century. And I'm trying to think if we know of anybody from the lower classes who has two homes in two different locations. I don't think I know of that as a phenomenon. Well, I'm not, I, I, I'm not saying how common it was, but it seems to me that's the straightforward way to read this. And I don't suspect that Joseph had palatial estates because they were from okay. the lower class, as you say. So if that's, he may have just been part owner of the family estate. Part in owner of the family estate. How oh, interesting. So, so I don't understand, though, then if, he, if he's got a home in Nazareth and a home in Bethlehem and they're coming back from Egypt, why does it say that they, they can't go where they want to go to Bethlehem, that they have to go to Nazareth? And why, didn't he, why wouldn't he just naturally go there? Matthew explains that because um, he says that he didn't go to Bethlehem because Archelaus yeah. was the ruler in that part of the country, and he knew how bad Archelaus was, so they diverted to the other place that they lived, which was Nazareth. Wow. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess the, pro the problem with it, I'm, you know, is that the studies of the economy of first century Palestine uh, show that people who are doing the kinds of work that apparently Joseph was doing, he's, he's called a tectone, mm -hmm. translated to carpenter, it just means a, somebody works with a hand, it's a very low level 
uh, kind of, uh, they, they didn't have much money. People lived hand to mouth and they didn't have multiple residences. So I, okay, it's an interesting idea. How about the genealogies? Do you think that uh, Matthew's and Luke's genealogies, in, in Matthew, as you know, the, in the two of them, you have descent from a different son of David, and then the, the grandfathers are different, the great grandfather, and the, the, the lines are different all the way. So what, how, how do you reconcile that? Well, um, so let's take a secular comparison. The current ruler, now you mentioned David lives a thousand years before Jesus. Yep. And the current ruler of England is Queen Elizabeth II. So we go from the 21st century all the way back to the 11th century. Who was her ancestor then? Well, one of them was William the Conqueror, the French king who conquered England. How is Queen Elizabeth descended from William the Conqueror? Actually, in multiple ways. And this is tr not just true of her, but lots of people. In particular, Queen Elizabeth is descended from William the Conqueror by his son, Henry I of England, and by his daughter, St. Adela of Normandy. Can I just interrupt you? Because I, sure. I, I see where you're going with this. But in Matthew and Luke, it isn't that way. They're naming the precise father. Right, I'll get there. Okay. So Queen Elizabeth is descended from William the Conqueror in multiple ways. And at some point, those lines merge. Well, Luke and Matthew are recording uh, Jesus' descent from David for perfectly straightforward reasons. At the time of the Babylonian exile, the prophet Jeremiah cursed Jeconiah, the last king of Israel before the exile, and said no son of his will sit on the throne. Well, there was an, a resulting confusion about did he mean his immediate son or none of his descendants? And so in Judaism, there's been a controversy about does the Messiah need to come from the line of Solomon or the line of Nathan? And those are the two lines that Luke and Mark mention. So Luke says he descended from David, uh, from uh, Nathan. So if you think that he can't be descended from Solomon, well, he, he's also descended from David by Nathan. But if you think he must be descended from Solomon, Matthew records he's also descended from Solomon. So at some point, these lines meet for Jesus, just like they do for Queen Elizabeth too. Okay, can I just ask which one is right? They're both right. Because according to Jesus's family. No, no, no. You, hmm? said, you said that some people thought he could not descend from Jeconiah. Oh. And so did he descend from Jeconiah or not? He did descend from Jeconiah through the Solomon line, which is preserved in Matthew. Um, how far distant is Jeconiah from Solomon? Mm, about 500 years. So why are there differences between them before that? Because G Luke is preserving the Nathan line and Matthew is preserving the okay. Solomon. So I'll just, you know, all I'll say is all you need to do is read this. And this isn't, this isn't just kind of a crazy liberal thing, but he, Raymond Brown, as you know, he's a great Catholic uh, he's scholar. He's not a crazy liberal? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, crazy liberal. The, the greatest, the greatest Catholic biblical scholar of the 20th century. I think you'd agree. I'll give him his props. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I mean, he, he. So this is not some kind of. I mean, it, it just it's father to son all the way, and they're different lines. And so, uh, okay. Well, let's move on to something else because we're we are running out of time. I would I would say very briefly. I have more answers on that. I won't take time now since Bart wants to move on. But go to jimmyakincom slash Bart and read the articles on the genealogies. <laughs> And if you really, if you really want to read what, uh, uh, read, uh, read Raymond Brown's uh, book, *The Birth of the Messiah*, where he discusses these things at great length. And and he is, he's, I don't know if you all, do they, do everybody know Ray Brown? He's, a, he's, I don't know a, if everybody he's, does. He's a, you know, he was a Catholic priest who taught, uh, who was a biblical scholar. He's one of these great Catholic biblical scholars after uh, Vatican II, and uh, people like. Him and John Meyer and Joseph Fitzmeyer. These are all great Catholic scholars who just agree that these genealogies don't work. So anyway, okay. Uh, do you think that if, I mean, in, in Luke's gospel, Jesus tells the disciples after the resurrection, don't leave Jerusalem. They're still there 40 days later. Uh, do you think that, uh, do you think that's right? That they didn't, did not leave Jerusalem? I think this is another selection issue. Um, we have Matthew indicating that they went, did go to Galilee, and we have Luke only mentioning that they stayed in Jerusalem. But as John reveals to us, 
Both of those are true. In John chapter 20, it's the day of the resurrection. Jesus appears, and a week later, Jesus appears to the disciples in Jerusalem. Then they go to Galilee. And in John 21, we read about what happened in Galilee. Right. That's right. So by the time Pentecost rolls around, they've come back to Jerusalem for the, for the okay. I travel it. feast. And Jesus tells them at that point, don't leave until afterwards. Okay, but in Luke's gospel, he tells them that on the day of the resurrection. It's quite explicit that, uh, that he, he uh, rises from the dead. That day he meets the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. That day he appears to the disciples. He immediately tells them that day, don't leave Jerusalem. And they're still there 40 days later. Is yeah. that not right? It is not right. It is right. No, because Luke doesn't say all oh, he of does. This. He does. Every point is on that day, at that same time, at that hour, re read Luke 24 and you'll see. Exactly what he says. Uh, my memory of the text is different. I, However, I, I, looked at it, I looked at it an hour before we came to make sure. Mm -hmm. Am I right about this? Yep, it is. So just, it, he tells them that day don't leave Jerusalem. Okay. And so Matthew says they immediately went to Galilee. And so <laughs> if you, I think there's more flexibility in there. And actually at jimmyakin.com slash Bart, there's a whole thing about how the resurrection accounts fit together. Okay. But at most, you would have Luke being wrong about a minor detail. What day did he give them this? A minor detail about where, what, about the resurrection appearances. Did Jesus appear? If he did, when and where? Mark says that the women didn't even tell anybody. Matthew says he appeared in Galilee. Luke says he appeared only in Jerusalem. Are these all correct? If they're not all correct, is any of them correct? That's the issue. It's not a minor issue. It's Luke, not a dating issue. Luke does not say Jesus appeared only. Oh, well, yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Okay. It, it does you, all, not you all look that. it up. And also look at Acts chapter 1, verse 3, where it says that Jesus stayed with them for 40 days in Jerusalem. Look it up. Okay, my time's up. I'm afraid to say, because Jimmy, I'd love to do this for longer, but I think now it's your turn to get me. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I brought props. <laughs> now, one of the things that uh, Bart said was that um, if you read the Gospels and try to put them together, then you're essentially writing your own Gospel. And he encouraged us to read the Gospels individually and see what each author has to say, what themes is he stressing, and so forth. And I agree, we should do that. <clears throat> we should see what is an individual author claiming, what are his themes, what's he implying, and so forth. But I don't think that means that we should just read everybody in isolation and not try to piece them together to figure out what the uh, historical figure behind all the sources is. In fact, that's part of what the criterion of multiple attestation does, is you look at different sources to see what you can figure out based on those sources about the history that the different sources are describing. And if you find a given story about Jesus attested in multiple different sources, that tells you something about it that's valuable. Well, here I have not four Gospels, but four biographies of Abraham Lincoln. This one by David Herbert Donald is considered the best by many people. It's just called Lincoln. There are others, though, like the real Lincoln, the Lincoln Enigma, and the Lincoln no one knows. And they all have different viewpoints. Now, what I would tend to do is read each book individually and understand what the individual author is saying, but then I would compare it with things mentioned in the other books and say, okay, what can I figure about Abraham Lincoln and what happened in his life that led to the different accounts? And I would be a detective. I would put together clues from the different biographies to construct my own understanding of what the history of Abraham Lincoln was. My question, Bart Ehrman, do you think that's how I should do it with Abraham Lincoln? And if I should do it that way with Abraham Lincoln, why shouldn't I do it with the Gospels and Jesus Christ? Um, if you've got those four accounts and they contradict each other on uh, a lot of points, then you're not going to be able simply to combine them in order to see what actually happened. You're going to have to decide which of these is accurate. If one says that, um, that, uh, that 
Lincoln was assassinated in John Ford Theater. And another says he was assassinated on the way to John Ford Theater, then, then you'd have to decide. And you wouldn't be able to say these are both accurate. OK. You would agree, though, that in principle, comparing different sources to figure out the historical behind them, the historical figure behind them is a good thing to do. And the reason it's a good thing is because each individual source is not reliable. So the historical process of what you're calling uh, of multiple attestation is the, the reason you use multiple attestation to figure out what happened in the life of Jesus is because we have these multiple sources. We've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We don't have other sources that can help us. And these four are so much at odds with each other that you can't just read one of them to know what actually happened. And so what you have to do is to figure out if there's some material that's in common among not, not the four sources, obviously, because as I said before, Matthew, Mark, and Luke themselves used earlier sources. And so what you look for, what the historian looks for, are independent sources that say the same thing. Because so often they say different things. So and the, the so historical task then is to figure out where they agree independently, given the fact they disagree so often. Okay, so let's talk about differences and similarities. In my second statement, I mentioned that uh, that simple, simply selecting certain material mm -hmm. does not make a contradiction. It doesn't make it wrong, and you agreed with that. Yeah. I also mentioned two other uh, things. Uh, one of them was paraphrase. Mm -hmm. Do you think that the evangelists paraphrase what Jesus said on various occasions, and when they paraphrase but communicate the same basic meaning, do you think that is a contradiction or do you think it's not? I think it's not. Okay, good. I agree. So I won't let the uh, guys in the white coats know about that. Um, the third ancient writing practice I mentioned was organization, either chronologically or topically. Mm -hmm. um, I assume you agree that the evangelists sometimes organize material topically, like um, Matthew collects different ethical teachings of Jesus together in the Sermon on the Mount, and he collects different prophetic teachings together in the Olivet Discourse. Do you think he is committing an error by doing that? It depends what you mean. I mean, it makes for a much better way of telling an account. The Sermon on the Mount is three chapters in, in Matthew, um, Matthew uh, 5, 6, and 7, and much of that material is also found in Luke in, in different places. And so I think it makes for a more pleasing account when Matthew's done that because you have this fantastic sermon. Uh, but the question we're asking isn't whether, that it's, whether it's an acceptable practice for authors to do that, which they do in the ancient world. We're asking whether it can be, uh, whether it's historically reliable. Did Jesus give a Sermon on the Mount that's now found in chapters five, six? In other words, is this a sermon he gave? It's a very basic question. Did Jesus give the Sermon on the Mount? And um, you know, he may have, but um, uh, the fact that he's organized these speeches, if you're saying that he's actually taken disparate materials and put them together into the sermon, then that would imply that, in fact, he did not give the Sermon on the Mount. This is an organizational method that Matthew's used. You would agree that he gave sermons at times. Yes. Okay. I think this is a Mr. Spock moment because in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, what I care about as a reader, whether, and this would be true whether I was an ancient reader, and it's certainly true of me as a modern reader, is not, did Jesus say all of these things at the same time? Mm -hmm. Instead, what I care about is, did Jesus say these things? Yeah. And so as long as Jesus really gave these teachings, I don't infer from Matthew that he gave every single one of them on the same day. Yeah, no, he might be historically wrong that they're, about there being a one-time thing. Yeah. And that's, but, there's but that's, the Mr. Spock bit, because I wouldn't call that being historically wrong. Okay. Because for someone to be wrong, they have to be making a claim. And I don't think Matthew is literally claiming these all were given at one occasion on the same day, any more should. than I think Mr. Chekhov is literally claiming we're going to get to the planet in two hours and zero seconds. Do you think that Matthew is literally claiming that Jesus rose three days later? Within the meaning of the within the meanings of those terms, yes, you as they were was, understood at the time, it's think, on the third day. You think it was three days later, so he's literal about this, but not that. Yeah, and I think the job of a scholar and a historian is to learn the rules of the genre well enough that you can tell when something is literal and when it's not. Yeah, like yeah, if yeah. I say to you, 
I really enjoyed our, our debate tonight, Bart. Thanks a million. Well, I'm not literally thanking you a million times. And you recognize that because you're a native speaker of English. But none of us are native speakers of the genre in which the Gospels no, no, are written. We yeah, have to learn that. Yeah, no, that's actually, I completely agree with that. The problem is that the genre that they're written on are ancient biographies, not, not modern biographies. And ancient biographies are notoriously historically unreliable. When you read Suetonius or Plutarch or these people writing biographies of Alexander the Great or Julius Caesar, you, you just know that there's stuff in here that is not accurate. And you say, well, that's, you know, they're making this stuff up. You know, Thucydides will say, for example, Thucydides will say that, uh, that the speeches that he gives, of course, are not what the people actually said. How would he know what they said? So if, Jesus, if, if you think Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew was written 50 years later in a different language from Jesus by somebody who wasn't there. How does okay. he replicate three chapters? Think about what you okay, would do okay, if okay. you had to replicate. I, I want to weigh in there. The because you know it's my cross examination. Okay. Time. I, thought, um, well, I, was, I thought I was, <laughs> I, was, I was answering your question, and I appreciate yeah, that. Okay, okay. Um, so I disagree that Matthew was written 50 years later. I think Matthew was written 30 years later. Okay. I also disagree that, um, that it was written by someone who was not there. What, even if it was, though, even if it was 50 years later, even if it was by an non-eyewitness, the question is, have these sayings been accurately preserved from right. the preaching ministry of Jesus down to the time that Matthew consigned them to paper? And because Jesus gave his teachings in highly memorable forms, like the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. How hard is it to remember that as a saying? Because right. they were circulated and repeated in the Christian community, uh, including by the people who uh, wrote the Gospels and their immediate sources, There's, I say we have a high reliability that these ethical teachings are well-preserved, just like you have admitted that various other individual sayings of Jesus are well-preserved. And speaking of an individual saying, um, you quoted Jesus in Mark's account on the cross saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, and my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you use that to communicate the idea that Jesus was despairing and thought God had literally forsaken him at this moment. What is Jesus quoting? when he says that. So he's quoting Psalm 22, 1, and he's only and, quoting and, verse and, 1. He's and not how quoting does the end Psalm, of the gospel. How does Psalm 22 end? As I was saying, he doesn't quote the end of Psalm 22. He quotes the verse about being forsaken. Look, so, in, in terms of individual so sayings, I, I would just I like to respond to your earlier I, question to me about the I, I individual sayings. I don't know sayings. about you. Since I'm you asked for, me about me, it, I, I, would like to, I would like to answer the question I'll about give individual you, sayings. I'll give you the opportunity in just a minute. If I'm being crucified, and your experience might be different, but if, if I'm being crucified and I want to signal that I'm in pain, but that I'm ultimately going to triumph, I probably won't quote all of Psalm 22 because I'm struggling to breathe, pushing myself up and down. And I would then quote the first line of the Psalm, just like I might quote the first line of a Hamlet soliloquy, and expect the audience to recognize it and know what I'm saying. And the way Psalm 22 works for people who may not be aware is it starts with the psalmist saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But by the end of the psalm, he's talking. the psalmist is talking about how, despite how it looks now, God's going to vindicate me. And I think Jesus is simply making an allusion there to that reality. Now, you wanted to add something. Well, I would just say that... I think if I were hanging on a cross and I felt like God was on my side, I would, and I had only one verse to quote, it wouldn't be the verse about being forsaken. It'd be, thank you, God, that you're on my side, like Luke said. As to the other thing I, I think wanted he was to in say, pain, too, and wanted to say that. Uh, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, the, the, we have saying speeches of Jesus, for example, in the Gospel of John, the farewell discourse that begins in chapter 13, goes through chapter 14, 15, 16, and 17. It's five chapters written 50, 60 years later in a different language. How 30. likely is it that, okay, say it's 30 years later. Uh, I would like one of you to write down for me uh, Obama's first inaugural address. <laughs> 
And I and you can't say, well, yeah, but you know, uh, you know, back then they memorized everything. They didn't. They didn't. It's a modern myth. They didn't memorize everything, and they didn't have better memories than you have. Uh, these speeches, ancient speech writers tell us that they have to make up the speeches because how else would they say anything about the speeches? Because they were, you know, there was it's twenty years ago, and so that's the problem. I mean, yes, I agree that. The fact that it's a sermon doesn't necessarily, a three chapter sermon of the sermon doesn't necessarily show it's inaccurate, but the burden of proof, if you want to say that it's accurate, you do have to show why you think so. And it isn't just because of positing that, well, it must have been this or it must have been that. You have to have evidence that it's accurate if you're going to claim it's accurate because people giving speeches 30 years ago are usually not able to be replicated. Okay, so I want to make one comment on that and then we'll turn it back over to Cy. On the, on the farewell discourse in John's gospel, I'm perfectly fine to say this is a paraphrase of what Jesus said that night based on an intimate associate's knowledge of his views and memories of what he said that night. And I'm willing to say it's a fair paraphrase. On the other hand, and I'm willing to say it's a fair paraphrase. On the other hand, if you look in John 14, I believe it's 1426, John says that Jesus says to the disciples in that discourse that I am telling you these things and the Holy Spirit will bring them to your mind later. So John is, is saying that Jesus gave them a promise of supernatural help in what they received from his lips that night. And speaking as a historian and not someone who can judge whether miracles occurred, you wouldn't be able to say, oh, well, that's wrong. God didn't give John supernatural assistance in remembering it. Wait, wait a second. You said it, that probably the Spirit did give him, but that's not a state. The Holy Spirit helped them remember, is what you're saying. But you're saying that's not a statement of faith? It's it is a, a statement it, of faith. Yeah. Okay. But it's not one that you can disqualify from a historical perspective. I thought you started out your talk saying that you weren't going to be talking, that, that nothing you say is based on a statement of faith. It's going I didn't to say that. I'm looking at it from both perspectives. From a secular perspective, it could be an extended paraphrase by an intimate associate. From a faith perspective, it could be supernatural assistance. But you and I have exceeded our time, so we better yes. give it back over to Sire. I didn't want to interrupt. Into a werewolf. It was getting good. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, let me explain what's going to happen uh, from here. What will happen next is a 10-minute break, and that break is 10 minutes. We will flash the lights uh, before uh, the break is over. After that, it will be your opportunity to ask questions of uh, Jimmy and uh, Bart. And the way we'll do this, if you have a question for Jimmy, J you better maybe start lining up now over there. If you got one for Bart Ehrman, line up over here. We'll have two microphones. We'll make sure they can see you when you ask your question, so don't worry about it. But uh, uh, if you got a question for Jimmy, line up over there. A question for Bart Ehrman, line up over here. We'll be back in 10 minutes. Do I get a line up over there? <laughs> <laughs> if you want. It's going to be very, very simple the way we're going to do this. I would really ask, and I'm sure that nobody in line is tempted to this, but occasionally someone is tempted to make it a speech rather than a question. Just ask a question. You know, a question is a sentence or two. Ask each uh, of the gentlemen. Sai, you, Sai, you speak like you've had that experience before. I don't know. Has that ever happened on the radio? Or yeah, something? it's like 10 hours of call-ins a week. I am familiar with the person who starts with a question with, my grandmother was born in Kentucky. Oh, that's not going to be a good that question. <laughs> all right. So uh, you've been a, a wonderfully polite audience. I would ask you to please continue that. I Myself, I must say, I've really enjoyed this so far. So let's have questions. We'll start the first question for Dr. Ehrman. The way we'll do it is we'll let Dr. Ehrman answer. Jimmy wants to make a comment. That's fine. Um, and if, if Dr. Ehrman, you know, each one will get to wrap up and then we'll go to the next question. Hello, sir. Hello. Uh, my name is Lenny. Um, Dr. Ehrman, I have a question. You've compared a lot of the Gospels tonight. What I'm curious about is, in terms of the historicity of these events, what impact does the oral tradition, when these events took place, when the events were first put pen to paper, and then when our earliest copies of these documents exist? I was just hoping you could maybe comment on yeah. how that relates to how much we can trust these from a historical point of view. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question about the oral tradition. I, I wrote a, you know, I wrote a book about this a few years ago called Jesus Before the Gospels, dealing with how oral tradition works. And I really loved writing this book because I spent about two years not reading anything involved with the New Testament or early Christianity. I spent two years reading stu uh, studies of memory. 
psychological studies of memory, soci sociology of memory, and anthropological studies of oral cultures to try and figure out how oral cultures pass on their traditions because all of us had grown up thinking, we're hearing that these oral cultures told things accurately, they didn't change things, they made sure they couldn't change things because they, they didn't couldn't check out the writing so they kept it all right. And uh, it turns out that's, that's just not right, it's not right. Uh, and so the, the gospel traditions um, when Mark writes his gospel, I think Mark was the first gospel. It's, it's generally conceded. Mark was the first gospel written around the year 70 or so. That means that he, he's writing it in Greek. He doesn't live in Israel. And so stories have been circulating for 40 years when he writes it down. He might have had earlier written sources. He doesn't say he did. But sources that circulate for 40 years uh, in, in oral cultures, they, 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 just, they change a lot. And uh, they just do. And so Mark is recording. And so the, that's why it's so difficult to know whether so much of this is actually historical because it's so much later uh, and it's based on story that one person tells another, tells another, tells another for, for decades. And these people who are telling these stories were not the people who were there. And so it's like, it makes it complicated. Um, I think that does complicate the matter. It doesn't mean that they're all completely inaccurate, as Jimmy's pointed out. I think a lot of things are probably accurate, but it takes a lot of work to show it. Our earliest manuscripts themselves are, uh, uh, for the Gospels, that's another problem. It's an unrelated problem. But for Mark's Gospel, for example, the first, so Mark, if Mark was written around the year 70, the first fragmentary Gospel Mark that we have is from about 130 years later, the first copy that we have. So it's copied and copied and copied and copied. And it was, you know, people scribes changed things. The first complete copy we have of Mark is, it, it is in the fourth century, 370 years later. So the first complete copy is 300 years of handwritten copies. And, and so that's also another problem. It's a different problem. But, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, Bart's just alluded to uh, Tradents, that's the fancy word for people who pass on a tradition, uh, to tradents going one after another, after another, after another for decades. Now, I don't actually think that the Gospels were written as long after the events as Bart does, and that's okay. Uh, what many people have compared this process of passing on tradition to is the telephone game where you know, uh, kids in school, one of them will start with a message and then they whisper it to the next kid and they keep whispering it down the line. And by the end of the line, you get something that's hilarious and totally unrelated to the original. And one of the problems with analogizing the gospel tradition to the telephone game is you're talking about kids. Of course, they're gonna screw it up. They're gonna screw it up on purpose just for laughs. So what about people who believe that Jesus is God and they are taking their souls in their hands and need to preserve this tradition accurately for the sake of the souls they're ministering to and for the sake of their own souls? I think that might have an effect. Now, it's not going to be, you're going to get some variation, but the studies in tradition that Bart's referring to will admit that the gist is much more accurately preserved than the individual wording than paraphrase, for example. On the other hand, this is an empirical question. And I said, let's test it. So I've actually been conducting the gospel telephone experiment where I took various traditions from apocryphal gospels. So they would not be ones that are familiar to the people hearing them, but they're like a story of Jesus, a saying of Jesus and so forth. And I've gone to people and said, call this telephone number and leave the message with the tradition you were assigned. And then I'll take that recording and give it to a new person. And thus I'll create this chain of people who are motivated Christians who are trying to take this seriously and preserve the gist of their tradition. And I wanted to have the results to announce to you tonight, but the experiment's taken longer than planned. But what I can say, is so far, they're pretty darn good at passing on the gist. The gist has not altered. I also would disagree with Bart that uh, the Gospels are the result of a telephone game. John's Gospel claims to be written, not necessarily, I mean, I'm sure he had a scribe, but claims to be written by an eyewitness, the beloved disciple. He says it flat out. Where? Uh, next to last verse in John 21. 
He says, this is, it says, this is the disciple who is bearing witness to these things and who has written them. Yes. He's basing it on a source. So the scribe is speaking on No, the, no, no, no. The author John is basing it on a source. In John 19.35, he says, uh, the, the wound of the side, that the, the disciple Jesus loved ha, has borne witness to this, and we know that the testimony is true. Yeah. Which means that's not him. Um, he did this. There is significant we, scholarly debate on that point. But I think John is very close to the original source. Even if you want to say it's one link further, fine. It's still not Oh, no, 30. it's not one link later. It's 60 years later. It, it, I'm talking in terms of links of tradition. And it if claims wants to, to be know based... About it, if you look at my book, I have a long list of uh, studies of the kind of thing you're talking about. And it's pretty clear how, how it happens. Okay. In any event, I don't think the Gospels are the product of telephone games. I think, according to the traditional account that is agreed with by many scholars, Mark is based on Peter. Luke is based on a variety of sources, including Peter and Mark. And John is based on an eyewitness. And Matthew claims to... Matthew if he's Matthew, would be an eyewitness. So I don't think there's a long link. So I, but I know lots of historical scholars. I don't know anybody who agrees with that. It's the traditional view. It's the, okay, yeah, we need, we need more. Okay, lots of, uh, next question Falcon. is for uh, Jimmy Aiken. Thank you both for an interesting evening. My question has to do with a topic you spoke on, which is multiple attestation. Um, in Matthew 27, 53, it basically describes the, uh, zombie apocalypse after Jesus's death, right? We have people coming out of the grave, they appear, we have darkness that comes over the land, we have a giant earthquake that shakes the earth. Uh, my question basically is, why do we not have any third party uh, attestation of this outside the Bible? Uh, why, why is that? Well, um, according, according, you do, uh, so the overall experience is reported in, now the raised dead who are not accurately described as zombies because zombies is someone who comes back damaged um, as opposed to someone God has raised. Yeah, they are mentioned uh, and they're only mentioned in Matthew. The, the other aspects of the experience like the earthquake and the darkness, those are mentioned more broadly in the gospels. And we do have early Christian sources that mention various aspects of them, but you could of course argue, well, they're just getting them from the gospels. So that's inconclusive. Um, there have been recent claims that uh, one, and I haven't had a chance to investigate these yet, so I can't vouch for this, but there are recent claims of uh, dating a particular earthquake to this time period that may be the one that's being referred to in the Gospels. I don't know if that's true or not, but these events were occurring in a place where they were of significance primarily to Jesus's followers, and so it's that community that preserved the memory of them. People outside of Jerusalem wouldn't have experienced them. They wouldn't uh, preserve the memory of them. And people who were opposed to Jesus and his message, they would have no interest in preserving them because they would tend to validate the Christian message. So, of course, they're not going to mention them. No, 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 no. I think it was a sandstorm. The sun just gets blocked out. There are sandstorms like this all the time. Yeah, I think it was a local darkness. It was an atmospheric phenomenon. I mean, it didn't have to be sand. It could just be thick clouds. But I think it was a local phenomenon. We know, the one thing we know is it was not an eclipse because it occurred at Passover and the moon's in the wrong position for an eclipse at Passover. Uh, yeah, I don't, have, I don't have anything to respond to that. Uh, Dr. Ehrman, uh, you noted how, for example, in Matthew, uh, Jesus did not speak of his divinity. Question, would it be fair to say that Jesus demonstrated his divinity by his actions for people familiar with the attributes of God in the Old Testament? For example, uh, forgiving the paralytic sins, walking on water, or calming the storm. Uh, these events were mentioned in Matthew chapters 9 and 14. Yes, thank you. It's a very, it's a very good question. Thank you. Um, what I would say is that in the Bible, people who are empowered by God are given the ability to do these things. In the Old Testament, you have people who are doing all sorts of miracles that only God can do because God empowers them. In Jesus' time, forgiveness of sins was something that priests in the temple would do. 
when there was a sacrifice, the priest would pronounce the person's sins forgiven. So when Jesus pronounces sins forgiven, what he's doing is not, not claiming to be God. He's claiming to have the power of the priest, that now the Son of God can forgive sins. And so I don't think that these, uh, I think that Matthew does think that Jesus is a divine being. I think that he does understand Jesus as the Son of God. I think that's right. My point is that Jesus does not claim equality with God in any of these other Gospels or the sources, except our very last one. And, uh, and you know, I've been influenced heavily by Raymond Brown, whose book on the, the community of the beloved disciple uh, argues that this is a later development within Christianity where people started thinking of Jesus in more exalted terms because of things that were happening within their community. And I, I just, I find that very convincing. But I do think that Matthew certainly thinks Jesus could do miracles, uh, but I don't, th I don't think miracle working makes a person God. And I would agree, just because uh, someone does miracles like walking on water doesn't mean that they're automatically God. Um, I also recognize the distinction that uh, Bart is making between the disciples believing that Jesus was God, which I think happened very early on, um, and Jesus himself claiming to be God. Mm -hmm. Where I would disagree is I think in the synoptics, we actually do have uh, indications that Jesus regarded himself as divine. He doesn't preach it openly because he'd get stoned, duh. And when he does mention it, it, even there indirectly in John in public, they recognize what he's saying and they pick up stones to stone him. So yeah, he was on the down low about the I'm God thing. Um, but he does, uh, he does indicate that he's the son of God and he is thus equal to the father in divinity. The same way, you know, Bart, you have a son, right? Uh, I'm not anywhere nearly as great as he. Well, but you, you have a son, your son shares your nature as a human being, and so in that sense you're equal, even though in a patriarchal society you would outrank your son. Yeah, no, that, in our society that's the way we look at it. Of course, in ancient Israel, the son of God, uh, the first one explicitly called the son of God is Solomon in 2 Samuel 7, 14. And so I don't think that Solomon was of the same essence as the father. No, I recognize the term son of God has multiple meanings, but Jesus's was, Jesus claimed to it was unique. And one place that we see that is in the gospel of Mark, when Jesus is on, so the very first gospel, Jesus is on trial before the high priest. The high priest says, tell us, are you the son of the blessed or not? And Jesus agrees obliquely and says, and from now on, you shall see the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, which is a reference to Daniel 7. Now, the high priest then says, you have heard the blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? So the high priest regarded this statement as blasphemy, which is a direct offense against God in speech. Well, claiming to be the Messiah was not blasphemy. Claiming to be the Son of God in a Solomonic sense is not blasphemy. So why does, he, why does he regard it as blasphemy? It's because of the reference to Daniel about you shall see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven to be enthroned with God. That's what's happening in that passage. And in Second Temple Judaism, which is when we are, there was a controversy about what is now in the scholarly community referred to as the two powers in heaven doctrine, where Jewish... Uh, People had been looking at passages in the Old Testament that seem to imply, yeah, there's this Yahweh in heaven, but there's this other divine figure too, who's sometimes called the second Yahweh. And Daniel 7 was one of those passages. And so it was recognized that Yahweh is enthroned, and then next to him, the second Yahweh is enthroned, according to two powers in heaven theorists. And so by saying, I'm that, I'm that, son of man who you're going to see enthroned in heaven, Jesus is claiming to be God, and that's why the high priest and the others regard it as blasphemy. Uh, Dr. Ehrman, the question was for you. So, if, if, I would just yeah. say that that, that that certainly would be convincing if what Jesus said was, I am the son of man coming on the clouds of heaven, in his reply to the high priest in Mark 14, 62. It's not what he says. He says, you will see the son of man. He, there's no indication in the passage he's talking about himself. Jesus in the Gospels talks about the Son of Man, but it's so anyway. We, okay. This one could go on all night because the people have written very big books about the Son of Man. Yeah, uh, I think next question is for Jimmy Aiken over here. 
Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity. My question might be a little bit off topic, but do you personally subscribe to Markan or Mathiam priority? And what are your own views on Q source material? Do you think its existence strengthens or weakens the case for reliability? Also, if you have time to comment, uh, what do you think of the work of modern defenders of the Hebrew gospel hypothesis, <laughs> like James R. Edward Edwards? So let's see if I can address those expeditiously. Um, I do believe that Mark was the first gospel to be written, and I'm not beholden for my views to any particular school of thought. I've entertained them all, I've read their arguments, but after reviewing, the comp after reviewing ancient compositional practices, Mark does not make any sense if it's not the first. And I actually have on uh, jimmyakin.com a whole section of papers I've written about the synoptic problem, and I go through the evidence for why I think Mark is first. Q, is, which is the supposed source behind about 235 verses that Matthew and Luke have in common, is, um, is a more complicated subject. The, and I don't have settled 100% views on this. I'm, I'm still open to various arguments, uh, but I lean towards a view that's called the Vilki hypothesis, which involves not Matthean or Matthew coming first, not Matthean priority, but Matthean posteriority. So at least the view I lean towards is Mark wrote first, Luke supplemented Mark, and then Matthew used Mark and Luke. And if you uh, have that as the paradigm, then you don't need to posit an independent Q source. Those 235 verses could have been taken and adapted from Luke. And so that's, so I tend to view Q as really just a part of Luke. At least that's the way I lean. The third uh, question you asked about was defenders of the idea that, of a Hebrew gospel. And I assume you're referring to the claim that Matthew wrote a Hebrew gospel. Um, we obviously know there were Hebrew gospels um, that were used uh, in Jewish Christian communities, but there's a claim that Matthew originally wrote his in Hebrew, and then it got translated into Greek. I don't tend to favor that view. I think there are other ways to explain that passage. At least based on the current state of my research, I would say that Matthew wrote in Greek, but he wrote in a Jewish style. Um, because that was his primary audience, and I think that's really what's being said in that passage. Uh, Dr. Ehrman, yeah, and then I we'll don't just need to reply. That's fine. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Uh, so the next question is for Dr. Ehrman. Hi. Uh, so uh, at some point, uh, Jimmy said that you know the the gospel authors were intending to write historically accurate accounts. I was curious if you agree that that's what they were intending to do, or if you think they had some other intention, maybe in addition, uh, and 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 therefore maybe uh, if you think some of the stories were actually intentionally fabricated for some purpose versus, you know, being mistaken like a game of telephone? Yeah, that's a great question. I, so I think that they, um, I think it's a complicated question because the gospels, I think the gospel writers don't have our sense of historical reliability and historicity. I think it's quite clear that the gospels are changing things so that it went, if, I mean, it's Jimmy, I, I agree with Jimmy that Mark was the first gospel and Matthew changed things. He changes things in ways that make it incommensurate with Mark. That shows that he's probably not just concerned about getting the historical details right. He's trying to convey a message. And I think when you read the Gospels, the mistake is thinking in modern 21st century terms about how somebody records a biography. We think they've got to be accurate, and that's what really matters. Well, these authors didn't have 21st century understandings of history and historiography and biography. They're writing, they don't call themselves histories. They're called, they, Mark introduces his book by saying it's a gospel. The word gospel in Greek, it's euangelion. It means preaching the good news. So his interest is, is proclamation. It's not recording history. And so, no, I don't think that they thought they were recording history the way we think of it. Even, even Luke, who's sometimes read that way because of his prologue, I don't, think, I don't think any of them are doing that. I think they're quite clearly trying to preach a message, a Christian message to their Christian congregation about the significance of Jesus as they understand it. I would agree with all that. I would just say that I think they are concerned about getting the historical gist correct, and I think they do. I, th I think we are at time. 
I, I, I think they had the clock set for 20 minutes, oh, so and then it minutes? ran down, and they've now reset it for 10. But I could be mistaken. Uh, I thought it was two. Yeah, I don't know. I, I really don't want to keep anybody longer than we said we were going to keep it. Anybody keep the time on that? <laughs> What's that? It was 20, so we have 10 more? Yeah. Is that okay with both of you? Is it, it, I think that's what we that, were that, doing. That, that's what we agreed, yeah. Okay. So uh, bring it on. All right, <laughs> 10 more minutes. This question is for Jimmy Aiken. <laughs> I apologize for that. Uh, no, I think uh, it was. It oh, was, yeah, that's clock setting. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, my question has to do with the supernatural claims of the Gospels. And I like how you brought up um, Lincoln and his accounts because there are actual books um, written about Lincoln being a vampire hunter or a vampire slayer. Abraham um, Lincoln vampire hunter, I know. Exactly, yeah. Also, and check out Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Exactly. Yeah, another one, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, but my question has to do with you also accept other um, historical uh, supernatural claims uh, brought up by these. And if you do not, then why do you accept su like supernatural claims brought up by the Bible? So I, um, I have a supernatural worldview. And so, and my worldview actually in, in certainly in this respect is very similar to the worldview of the both the Israelites in the Old Testament and the Christians in the New Testament. They didn't assume that only we have supernatural things happening. Um, they would, uh, in fact, assume that other groups of people did have miracles occurring in their community. And these miracles could be due to God having mercy on these people, or they could be due to fallen angels tricking people, or some of them would be hoaxes but the genuine ones didn't have to be just for us. Jesus himself talks about this um, when he is discussing exorcism. And he's been accused of, of, you know, exercising demons by the power of the devil. And he says, well, if that's how I'm doing it, how are your sons doing it? So Jesus acknowledges that there were Jewish people who were driving out demons. So you didn't have to be a member of the Christian community for God to do something supernatural through you. And so I would say that I have to take supernatural accounts reported outside the Christian community seriously. I was listening to a, di a discussion that Bart Ehrman had with, I believe it was Tim McGrew, a Protestant philosopher and apologist, and the Baal Shem Tov came up. The Baal Shem Tov was the founder of Jewish Hasidism, and Bart correctly pointed out that a lot of miracles were attributed to the Baal Shem Tov very early and by people who knew him and they're all documented very early. And Bart's question for Tim McGrew was, well, why would you take these seriously? And McGrew tried to backpedal a little bit, but I wouldn't. I'd say um, I'd have to look at the evidence. I haven't had a chance to look in detail at the claims about Baal Shem Tov's miracles, but I would look at them open-mindedly because God does do miracles outside the Christian community, and I have to be open to that. Now, then there's a sub-question of, well, why be a Christian if there are other miracles? Answer, because, in short form, uh, because God has given us bigger and better miracles like the resurrection of Jesus, and there are a whole bunch of fulfilled prophecies and things like that. So I think even though there are miracles, supernatural acts, occurring outside of the Christian community, the evidence still points to Christianity as the correct understanding of the supernatural world. Yeah, great. Thank you. So my question would be in relation to the crucifixion accounts that were brought up earlier. So in, in, so earlier we were saying that if we don't look at them side by side and they comparatively match up, then we have to conclude that there's inconsistencies and therefore unreliable. So in Mark, we see Jesus silent, Luke, he's speaking. In Mark, we have, we have him saying, oh my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? which Jimmy uh, concluded earlier, reference to Psalm 22, which Jews of the time would have, would have known, like we know the Our Father. I, I imagine they would have known the whole thing, uh, at least a devout Jew. And so, and then in, in Luke, we have him, uh, in both accounts, we have the veil tearing. And in both accounts, we have the ultimate message being received that Jesus is the Son of God. So Mark, predominantly Jew and so Jewish audience, Luke, predominantly Gentile audience we would have to take those audiences into account across the rest of the gospel, which some would say would justify those small inconsistencies, which ultimately uh, convey the same message across the gospels. 
So from a skeptic's perspective, my question is why, why isn't the skeptic's, skeptic's perspective taking the audience intended that is receiving a message more into account? Oh, thank you, it's a good question. And uh, my view is that's exactly what I'm doing. I'm taking the audience into account. If we were trying to ask what message was each one trying to convey to its audience, the audience is everything. If we're trying to ask, is this what happened? That's a different question. For example, if I address all of you as a Catholic audience, and I, I phrase things one way that, uh, for example, that I, I say, you know, I think the, the Catholic tradition is just, you know, it's, it's the best it's the best tradition that in, within uh, in Christianity. It's an ancient tradition. It goes back, and these Protestants, you know, they're just trying to go back to the Bible, and they're ignoring their tradition. If I say that here, and then I go to an evangelical audience, and I say, you know, I really think you have the best tradition in Christianity because you're, you're ignoring all of this nonsense that was going through the Middle Ages, and now you get back to the Bible, and you're getting back to Jesus. So I'm addressing different things to different audiences, so the question is, uh, you know, what do I think? And uh, so the audience is, does matter, but uh, the audience is precisely the reason these things get changed so that they're no longer accurate, historically accurate. I'm not saying they're not religiously accurate, but historically you can't have, I mean, when they're at odds because of the audience. I'd agree, except I think it's matters of selection and emphasis, so I don't think they're fundamentally different. Next, thank you. Next question for Jimmy. Um, okay, so, oh. Um, so our question was that basically, if Luke used his, as his primary source, Mary, the mother of Jesus, then, um, uh, then that wouldn't that be the most reliable out of all the Gospels? So why are the other Gospels taken into account if technically Mary was like the son? I mean, <laughs> the, yeah, mother. the mother of Jesus. So no, I, why, I guess I'd say it. So how come like, why do we account that either he was born in Bethlehem or Nazareth? And in Luke, it says one way. So and that was by Mary. So. Okay, so um, I'm not aware of anyone who thinks that Mary was Luke's primary source for his entire gospel. And it's pretty clear that, that actually that's not the case because he used about 40% of Luke's gospel is actually based on Mark. Um, but for the first two chapters of Luke's gospel, um, there are indications that he's getting these traditions from Mary. Uh, that doesn't mean he personally interviewed her. He may have done that but we don't have uh, what I would consider proof of that from the text. What we do have is Luke saying twice in the infancy narratives that Mary remembered these things about Jesus' early life in her heart. And the way I read that, Luke is telling us who his tradent is for this material, who his tradition bearer is. It's Mary. She experienced these things, she remembered them in her heart, and somehow Luke got that information. He may have got it by interviewing her personally, or he may have got it through someone else. He may have got it from a written document. And I've seen arguments that it may have been a written document based on various factors that are kind of complicated to go into here. Um, but I think that, uh, that that material is accurate, Bart, I think, likely disagrees to a significant extent. But I would say that, uh, that Luke 1 and 2 are based on memories that ultimately come from the Virgin Mary. Thank you. I, I have to tell you, this will be the last question uh, because we have to get to the concluding statements after this. So go ahead with your question for Dr. So Ehrman. Make it a zinger. Yeah, man. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, Dr. Ehrman, Jimmy, thank you for your service and um, sharing your perspectives for Could everyone. Could you speak right into the microphone? Yes. Um, my question is... Uh, Square dance caller tip. Right. <laughs> um, this has to do with Matthew, Mark, and Luke being the synoptic gospel, preparing for the kingdom of God to repent, while the gospel of John brings the identity of Jesus. Um, I wanted to ask specifically about the story of the woman anointing Jesus. The, uh, the woman, adjoin, the sinful woman anointing Jesus' feet. At the end of Luke 7, um, does Jesus' phrase saying your faith alone has saved 
you go in peace, does that imply that, you know, that the woman's faith in Jesus was that he's the son of man? Um, yeah, no, it's, a, it's an interesting question. So it happens a lot in the, in the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that when somebody gets healed uh, by Jesus, Jesus will say, your faith has healed you. And it's, it's an interesting perspective because it means that the person's faith is what's generating the miracle. Like when the woman comes up and touches Jesus, she's been bleeding for 12 years and she touches the hem of his garment and, and, she, he, and she, he says, your faith has healed you. And so it does show that, that these gospels do understand that, uh, that Jesus is the one sent from God who has the power of God. That, that passage in Mark I just mentioned says the power drained, he knew that the power drained out of him. And so it's a very, it's a very interesting passage because it means that he's got power that's been given him that is drained out. So I think that the gospel, these gospels do in fact, yeah, think that Jesus has, has this power, but it doesn't make him the son of man as a technical term. Um, the son of man, uh, I agree with Jimmy that that comes from Daniel chapter seven, and it refers to a cosmic judge of the earth who's coming to destroy the forces of evil. And I don't think it's directly connected with, with the healing miracles per se. And for once I'll shut up. <laughs> Other miracle. I was gonna say, um, <laughs> the, hey, who do you think I am, Tim Staples? <laughs> Uh, uh, all right, now it's time for uh, each uh, gentleman will get five minutes of a concluding statement. I promise you I will get the clock right on this one. Uh, Dr. Ehrman, your concluding statement. Well, thank you, thank you all very much. You've been very generous, and I, I appreciate it. Um, I, uh, uh, a number of times I've given talks to uh, large groups of uh, Protestant evangelical fundamentalists, and uh, they're usually nice too, but uh, not not as nice as you. <laughs> um, I don't I don't have a lot to say in conclusion. I want to say something about just kind of a broad overview of things that I I think that the Gospels of the New Testament are best seen as documents of faith, uh, not as historically accurate accounts of what actually happened in the life of Jesus. In the modern world, that seems kind of problematic. You know, because we're, we're so used to things like not things having to happen in order to be right. So you watch a movie and you say, uh, you know, you say, is this is this true? Is this a true story? And my kids used to ask me that we'd watch a movie. They'd say, is this a true story? And I'd always say yes. And they'd get that look in their eyes. I say, no, no, no. Did it happen? I said, no. There are a lot of things that are true that didn't happen. If you believe in the Gospels, it's not because you can prove they're historically accurate. I mean, that's not, you know, faith isn't a matter of proving that they're accurate. You're listening to the stories that these authors have given you. And if you're a Christian, you believe they've been inspired to give you these stories. So you shouldn't make them into something that they're not. I think the differences in the Gospels are really important for all sorts of reasons. But one thing is that I think that these, in response to a question was given, I think these Gospel authors are changing things in order to communicate their particular message. And if you pretend they're saying that someone else is saying, then you're, you're getting it wrong. But you're also ignoring the fact that in different situations, different times, different audiences, as somebody said, you've got... You people have to phrase things in their new situation, in the new context that they're in. And so each gospel changes things according to his own perspective and what he feels God is leading him to say. That's significant because it doesn't relate just to the gospels. It relates to the entire Christian tradition. The context within which we all live changes. Our context is different for each of us, but also there are different historical differences between different Christian audiences. The message has to change because the context changes. And this isn't true just of the Gospels. It's true of everything you believe as a Christian. You are not living in the first century. You're not living in the days of Jesus. The message has changed. We have different views of things today than people had in the first century. We have different views of the relationship of men and women, for example. Uh, we have different, different understandings of, uh, of, uh, sexual, uh, of sexual orientation. We have different understandings of why, why people have different sexual orientations. We have different understandings about gender identity than we used to have. 
things change. The message has to change to accommodate what we think now. We don't live in the first century. We also don't live in the Middle Ages. And we don't live in the, uh, in the, uh, at the time of the Reformation uh, and the, the conflicts going on then. We don't live in the 1950s. The message has to change or it's not actually being faithful to the gospel message. Because the point is that the gospel message is renewed every time that it's context. That's how everyone living in a tradition ought to treat their tradition. Thank you very much. Jimmy Aiken. You know? There we go. So I want to thank Bart for coming and having this exchange tonight. I've enjoyed it very much. I want to thank everybody else for coming as well. Tonight, we've looked at the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we've asked the question, are they fundamentally reliable or fundamentally unreliable? Well, in a debate, uh, the person who agrees with the resolution has the burden of proof, and Bart agrees with the resolution, which was that the Gospels are unreliable because turnabout is fair play for once. So Bart had to show that they're not reliable. I only have to show that he didn't prove that. Reliability is actually a spectrum, but it's a mistake to set the threshold of reliability at 100% because that makes it the same thing as inerrancy. And inerrancy is not the same thing as reliability. Without a time machine, there is no way to go back in history and evaluate every claim in the Gospels independently to verify it. So we can't say what percent of the time are they right. Instead, I've proposed that a source may be judged historically reliable if we can verify many of its major claims, many of its intermediate claims, and many of its lesser claims. And we're entitled to regard it as historically reliable until we've seen enough errors to counterbalance that. Now, in assessing those errors or proposed errors, we have to take into account ancient writing practices like selection, paraphrase, and sequencing, and those involve approximations. But different degrees of approximation do not amount to an error. Mr. Chekhov is right when he tells the captain we'll be at the planet in two hours, and Spock is right when he tells the captain we'll be at the planet in a few seconds ahead of two hours. Neither is wrong. They're just using different levels of approximation. It's a mistake to press the details of a gist account as if they are precise, because they're not. They are meant to be approximate and convey the essence of what happened. So what, what, what happens when we weigh things up? Well, Bart is proposed that there are some passages, he's named a few of them tonight, that he regards as places where the Gospels have errors in them. And we can be, grant that for the sake of a hypothetical argument. We could even double the number of errors that have been brought up tonight. If you want to do more research, go to jimmyakin.com slash Bart. And check out Bart's books too, but go to jimmyakin.com slash Bart and get both sides of the story. In terms of the evidence that's been presented tonight, we've seen the Gospels vindicated on numerous major claims, intermediate claims, and lesser claims. And fundamentally, the proposed errors, even in expanded form, do not counterbalance all of the things that Bart himself has admitted the Gospels are probably right about. And so, I would assert that as nice a guy as he is, Bart hasn't met the burden of proof, and yes, the Gospels are historically reliable. I also want to uh, say a special word, because Bart asked at the beginning about how many people here are Catholics and how many are here to see him get creamed, and it takes a lot of guts to, uh, to do that. So I want to give a big round of applause to Bart Ehrman. Thank you very much. Bart Ehrman and uh, Jimmy Aiken, ladies and gentlemen.